Thank you. And I'd like to start our session, if you will, by giving yourselves a round of applause. Um, this has been quite a rich and rewarding day, and uh, your participation has been so meaningful uh, to those of us who are um, having the conversation up here. So please join me in um, acknowledging what a great set of participants we have had. When we were designing this conference um, six or so months ago, uh, Jana and, um, and Rochelle and I were thinking, boy, it would be great to have uh, an opportunity to really bring in practitioners and policymakers with the uh, research community. And I think this has really exceeded our expectations. And I just want to once again thank uh, the National Building Museum for being such a terrific partner in helping us uh, bring this event to um, such a successful uh, fruition and, and to a, our, our immediate, almost immediate close. To do that, we have quite a distinguished panel that I'm going to introduce now. And we're going to just try to bring this all together, synthesize everything we heard and learned, and give us some, <laughs> give us some food for thought for the future, uh, and really help us bring together the various strains of conversation that we um, have had throughout the day. So please um, join me in welcoming our panel, uh, which um, starts with uh, Zab Briggs. Uh, Zav was most recently um, director of the general government branch in OMB, uh, but returned to MIT where he is an associate professor of sociology and urban planning, and we're delighted to have you back uh, with us in DC. And sitting next to Zav uh, is Nancy Andrews, and Nancy is president and CEO of the Low Income Investment Fund, headquartered in San Francisco, but that's hard to believe, in Nancy, because I seem to see you a lot uh, in DC these days. Um, and then next to uh, Nancy is Derek Douglas, a special friend um, to many of us and to HUD, who's special assistant to the president for um, urban policy and the domestic policy council in the White House. Welcome, uh, Derek, to this conversation. Sitting next to uh, Derek is Francie Ferguson, who's um, senior manager for the National Real Estate Programs in NeighborWorks America. Uh, Francie, it's great to see you here today joining this conversation. And then Mike Stegman, a uh, former colleague uh, of mine, well known to many of you, uh, is Director of Policy and Housing at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, as well as, I understand, teaching on the side quite a bit. <laughs> uh, and uh, a new course, I understand, at the University of Chicago coming uh, this winter. And then um, to round out our panel is uh, Dr. Sandy Newman. Um, and uh, Sandy is a professor of policy studies at Johns Hopkins Institute of Policy Studies, Johns Hopkins uh, University. So with that, um, please help me welcome our panel, and we will get started in our conversation. So we've just spent, since 8.30 this morning, <laughs> listening to a variety of panel discussions on the relationship between housing and education and self-sufficiency and health, two secretaries having a conversation about the connection between housing and health. It's been a really, as I said, rich and rewarding day. Um, so our job is to really sit back, uh, help uh, everybody reflect on uh, what we heard, what we learned. Um, and one of the overriding themes that seemed to come out in almost every single panel discussion was this issue of what kind of evidence is the most effective in influencing policy? Um, and we heard a lot of different ideas, but Mike, I'd like you um, to help us start our uh, thought process on this. You, you know, MacArthur, as we have heard, has invested significant resources in generating evidence that I think it hopes will influence um, policy. What kinds of evidence do you think are most uh, effective at influencing, in particular, federal policy makers? Well, thank you, uh, 
Erica, for all uh, you've done here in bringing us uh, together. I think in the morning, when Julie Stash said the goal of one of the goals of the conference is to not only kind of explore whether housing matters, but how housing matters. I think the conference made really a significant contribution uh, to that area. Some of the evidence uh, that we heard presented today um, is forecasted, is projected, um, is not uh, really validated in the kind of rigorous way that I think uh, we need to proceed in order to actually have an effect on budgeting practices and policy. Um, obviously, in my view, uh, policy debate around housing assistance is going to be heavily influenced over the next coming months and years by the final evaluation of moving to opportunity uh, because it is a random control trial. Uh, because it has been found to have significant uh, health effects, uh, whether anticipated or unanticipated. But I think what we have to do is continue to deepen our studies, uh, make sure we're doing studies that really have clear counterfactuals uh, in comparison to what. Uh, what, is the, what is it that is the value added? Um, we have to do it in a variety of kind of market settings and conditions. But I think where we know that housing matters, where there seems to be some evidence, um, the whole research program that we've created is about effects, the benefit side, if you will. I think now in areas where we think that there may be significant benefits, it is time to bring costs back into the picture. Uh, ultimately, we have to ask, are the extra benefits worth the cost? Now, in the last panel, uh, we thought that we heard it's not just benefits worth the cost, but there is some argument that actually costs are negative subsidies. That is, they create opportunities to reduce the cost of housing programs or other areas. I think that's an area very important and ripe for further research. So Zav, um, you were most recently at OMB, and we've spent a good part of today talking about um, how if we get savings in one program, um, how we can uh, credit another program. Um, I guess in your kind of position at OMB, what kind of evidence most influenced you? And what do you think, if you will, want to speculate, what do you think, what kind of evidence most influences uh, Congress? Um, well, thank you, Erica, and, and I'm grateful for being here. Um, I agree with Mike on one hand that effectiveness and cost effectiveness are huge. To be honest, there's a lot that government does that we don't have good measures on. Uh, we don't have good measures of effectiveness or cost effectiveness necessarily. Um, and we plow ahead anyway, and that is, that's a, a piece of the story worth spending a moment on, too. Um, there is a third kind of, uh, of uh, information that Mike uh, spoke about a moment ago, and that is evidence on savings generated or costs avoided and that kind of thing. And it's true that that's extremely precious when you can, when you can generate it. OMB pays attention to it. Um, it has to do so in all candor somewhat informally. And the prior panel debated this mm -hmm. uh, a little bit, and I'll give the quick version of a longer story, but connecting you know, how the executive branch does budgeting to what Congress does and how the appropriations process works. Uh, the, the bottom line is that for most instances where government generates cost savings through doing something, let's say, preventive, regardless of what it's preventive of, preventive of tax fraud, mm -hmm. preventive of healthcare fraud, preventive of, uh, you know, additional health spending of a particular kind, Medicare, Medicaid, anything else, prisons for that matter. Um, in most instances, the budget process is not able to directly reflect that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And in this arena, I would say, to put it very bluntly, there is reality, there is aspiration, and then there's fantasy. And I would hate to see a lot of time wasted on fantasy. 
Um, but I'm all for aspiration. And I would say the sweet spot looks something like this. Mike's right that we can generate better evidence. Um, we can take it to appropriators. We can take it to OMB. They do care about this kind, some people anyway, care about this kind of information. And frankly, um, you know, the, the good news about Congress is they write the rules and they can change the rules. I don't see budget scoring around these kinds of things and the things that make it quite conservative. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, for example, the Congressional Budget Office has not even credited what we spend preventing tax fraud when they're budgeting for the IRS. That's astounding when you think about it. So imagine trying to convince them about these kinds of things. Well, if you spend on housing, it comes out the other side and help. That's a long ways off. What is not unrealistic is the following. Um, at the end of the day, each appropriations committee has its own zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. The reality is that if you put appropriations chairs in a room and say, you know, there are these really powerful preventive investments we could be making. This is smarter health spending. Affordable, secure housing is health care of a kind. And they sort of say, well, I get it, and that the evidence seems compelling. But, you know, I have the incentives that I have. Inviting them to go cooperate is not a recipe for progress. Um, because they have a zero-sum game, they compete for dollars. The way this works is, over time, you build the evidence base and you go to leadership and the appropriations chairs. Those are the folks that write the rules and they can decide how they want the accounting to work. And they have all sorts of ways of informally crediting different committees for making various kinds of spending decisions. Um, so I am hopeful, I mean to sound optimistic, mm -hmm. but I also want to give that dose of reality about how the budget process works. That was a big dose. Uh, Sandy, did you want to uh, <laughs> jump Didn't in sound here? too optimistic to me. Um, yeah, just wanted to um, uh, build on uh, Mike's uh, comment and pick up on something Jens Ludwig said in the last panel, and that is um, understanding the mechanisms, really how the emphasis on the how. If it does matter, how is that happening? And um, I think we've had, as Tom said um, in his remarks, um, a kind of conventional wisdom operating on what we think, uh, you know, X is affecting Y. But when we see these mysteries and puzzles of how people actually behave in housing markets and with respect to housing assistance, uh, we realize we don't really understand this very well because they're not operating according to these what we view as common sense principles. So until we get inside that and understand these mechanisms, I think it's going to be very difficult to do a very effective and efficient job in the programs. So um, a number of folks asking questions, and certainly across the panels, we both represented sort of federal policy, but also the role of state and local policy. So I want to shift Nancy um, to acknowledge the fact that the feds aren't the only ones making policy decisions. Um, we see a lot of decisions happening at the state, local but e levels, but also by practitioners in the kinds of uh, ways in which they um, create and build and, and align um, their housing with their other kinds of <coughs> services. What kind of evidence do you think matters at those other levels? You know, um, it, it's really interesting because I think, Erica, yes, it's important what happens at the state and, and local level, but I also want you to know that we love the federal level, so it's <laughs> out. Um, but that said, um, in some ways, I think of the work that's being done by practitioners like my organization and, and there are others in the room as being those that actually create the evidence. Um, we may not know exactly how to measure it, and we may not have a full appreciation for all of the multiple variables that have to be teased out, but we really are in the business um, of creating it. And I think the next decade for us is going to be figuring out how we use the work that we do in the field to bend the cost curve so that we can continue doing this work for decades to come. Um, I, a good example mm -hmm. of the way that I see this playing out um, is one of my, our colleague organizations, Mercy Housing, in San Francisco, um, has a project that's called Mission Creek, and Sister Lillian Murphy likes to talk about this project a lot. Um, but this is a project where um, a local nursing facility, Laguna Hana Hospital, actually relocated about 50 residents into 
uh, this housing where they received supportive services and these uh, people that had been in skilled nursing facilities could begin to age in place. Um, the Department of Public Health recognized the cost savings that came as a consequence of being able to house uh, these elderly uh, uh, individuals in the Mission Creek housing. And they estimated that they took what had cost them about $40,000 a year per person down to about $10,000 a year per person. And so that one project actually saves the city a little over a million dollars every single year. And each year, thank goodness, uh, the kind folks in, in San Francisco send a letter to Sister Lillian saying, you have saved the city a million plus dollars this year. Um, and I, have, I understand, although I'm not sure, there, that there is actually now a bit of a, say, a sharing going on. That, that we can help you provide some of these services by sharing some of these savings with you so you will do it more and, uh, and more broadly. Now, um, we're also, I'm in the process of organizing a conference that's gonna be here next week that's looking at an issue very similar to this one, which mm -hmm. is community development and health. Um, and Sister Lillian is on one of the panels for that conference and as is uh, senior official from uh, HHS. And as she was describing this, this process that I just described of, of cost savings, um, and she was trying to explain what community development was and what community developers did, she explained how hard it is to raise the money for the supportive housing that really makes so many of these things go forward, how hard it is to raise money for the services. So we go from foundation to foundation, and it's very difficult to find enough funding streams to really put the pieces together. And first, uh, one of the most important things that came out of this call was that the official from HHS learned what community development was. So that was very important. And then second, learned how community development could really benefit his agency. And so between those two conversations, we really had, um, I would say the effect of practice on the ground, uh, creating evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, we had local policy, if you will, changing and some sharing being done of savings. And then we had that translated up to the federal level with a recognition mm -hmm. on the part mm -hmm. of federal officials about the value of community development and housing. Just yeah, absolutely. 30 Sarah. second mm -hmm. point just to add on. Um, one of the reasons we care about what the federal government does is because of this connection to state and local mm -hmm. decision making. Because so many of the important decisions are made at those levels. And I think we care not only about the federal government uh, removing barriers mm -hmm. and tr using things like eligibility rules, things that the prior panel talked about as well, to move in this direction. Over time, we want it to nudge in a constructive way. <laughs> to say, you know, if, if 15 states mm -hmm. are doing it and you're in the other, you know, the majority that aren't, the onus is on you to explain why. And that can happen, especially as the evidence improves over time. And Congress and the executive and any administration can send a strong signal that it wants to see this kind of thing happening. One and we can things. incentivize it too, I would say. Yep. We can find ways of making it easier for folks at the local level to create the stories. Yep. Mm -hmm. what, one of the things that we found, I, you know, I have the fortune of working nationally, but actually living in Austin, Texas. And so we sometimes are taking the national work or the national research and then seeing how we can apply it in a very local setting. And, and what we find, of course, is that at, with many people, an elected city council, a state legislature, a, a, school, a school board, many people aren't actually going to read the full research. They want to know what the headline is, and then they want to see an example on the ground that's working. Mm -hmm. And so if you can put those two things together, you can then move practice, whether that's the QAP for the tax credit allocation, or whether it's gaining support for a local general obligation bond that would put significant money into housing, whether it's the school board beginning to contemplate using school land for the placement of housing in order to increase access to opportunity. So sometimes it's that sort of praxis of, of 
of getting from the research to the headline so that the elected official or the business leader who influences the elected official mm -hmm. can really understand the simple headline and then see it on the ground and then that winds up moving local policy. So, so Derek, do you have any thoughts on this, reflections from folks who come to you in the White House <laughs> trying to convince you that their <laughs> program, their policy is the absolute well, best thing? Um, yes, I've had those meetings before. <laughs> um, I think to your, the point that Francie was just making, um, we have a, I think you're exactly right, and, you know, even from a federal level where I sit and talking to the folks on the Hill and others who we need to try and work with to get federal policy done. They, you need, the, the research is very, very important, but if you don't have the concrete example, it's very, very hard to get things to move because that's the type of thing that a member sees in his mm -hmm. or her district or a president can talk about. Those are the types of things that really matter. Um, we have a, a working group called the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. And I know some of the members of that, that group are here, but that's a working group. Um, we have a lot of interagency place-based groups in the White House, but that one, I think, in particular, really was born out of the research and some of the evidence ar around the effectiveness of comprehensive community development and thinking about doing, um, attacking issues of concentrated poverty and the like in a holistic way. I remember some of the early meetings where um, Erica and Raphael, I think Zab was very instrumental in, a lot of the folks who have a lot of policy background in this area, but also have a research background, we really grappled with what are the critical agencies, how should we approach the work, what does the evidence really say? And through that, um, this NRI, we brought together HUD, HHS, um, the Department of Justice, the um, Department of Education, and the Treasury Department, particularly the CDFI fund and are now looking to expand to some other agencies that are also um, very important. And the whole concept, you know, what motivated us was the research, but also I think there was a, a self-interest of the agencies recognizing that I want my housing program to work. I want my investment to be effective. And they felt that it could not be effective if it was done in isolation. If you didn't have a safe community, you didn't have good schools, so people would want to live there, you didn't have other kind of commercial and economic development amenities, the housing investment wouldn't work. And so, you know, to the point of this conference about how housing matters, the whole NRI approach is that all these different issues are um, very much interrelated. Um, one th chat question or, or issue I want to raise on the evidence point, because this has come up a number of times. I don't know if it's a researcher has got to figure out how to do it or whatnot. And Zav, you'll remember this when we were working on growth zones. But in the federal, at the federal level, a lot of times when we're creating programs, there are multiple streams, sometimes multiple agencies investing to get a certain thing done. So like in the empowerment zone example, you had grants coming out of one agency, you had tax credits over here, you had loan guarantees from this agency. And one of the things, and each of those have different appropriators and different people who you have to convince in order to get that package together. And a lot of the research that we've seen, what they'll do is they'll study the program and they'll say, here's what existed before this program happened, here's what existed afterwards, here's the impact. <laughs> but when we say what components of that really made the difference, they can't answer that question. And we can't guarantee that if you're doing this again, you're going to get all those components. So we want to say, well, was it the tax credits? Was it the grants? And it's very, very hard mm -hmm. um, to, to disaggregate that. We were looking, we were, I was just having a conversation in the White House about that again recently with respect to um, housing and workforce training, that sort of thing. And so one of the challenges, I think, that where evidence could really, um, or the evidence could really help us out at the federal level is helping us to not just understand the effectiveness of a particular program and the change it made on a community, but disaggregating what components really were the drivers, which, or which ones were more important than the others, so that when we're trying to go and work to get more resources, particularly in tough budget environments, we know where to focus and that we don't have to have it all. So, so Sandy. <laughs> um, Tom, I know you're part of the MacArthur uh, Net Research Network, which is trying to disaggregate some of these different dimensions of housing. 
Um, but you already mentioned we need to isolate the mechanisms to get a better handle on policy. What are your thoughts about these gaps in our current uh, research uh, that we have to date? And what are some thoughts about sort of the research agenda going forward that would help to address some of the concerns that Derek's raised and others have cited? Okay, so a little truth in advertising here. Um, this conference is called How Housing Matters, and a year or so ago I wrote a paper called Does Housing Matter? <laughs> so I've been spending uh, sort of my professional lifetime actually searching for evidence that it does matter. And um, I am very fond of a quote that's attributed to Mark Twain, but through Googling I found that many other people have claimed this quote as well. <laughs> Um, which is that the problem is not so much what we don't know, but what we think we know that just ain't so. And so we've got a lot of conventional wisdom about what we think we understand, and um, within the realm of, uh, of housing programs, what happens is we look at the functioning of a big infrastructure programs and we find some puzzling uh, situations, mostly behaviors. Um, it was mentioned earlier that we actually have fairly low take-up rates, lower than we would expect of this huge bounty of a voucher worth about $7,000. Why is that? Why is it that about uh, a fifth to a quarter of voucher recipients relinquish these vouchers while they're still income eligible for the $7,000 or so? dollars? Um, why do we see a small, if any, effect on the quality of the housing and neighborhood that voucher recipients uh, live in, as opposed to seeing a huge effect, which I think we all understand, on the affordability of housing uh, for those people. So these are very complicated mysteries, at least to me, and what I think we do know is that the population is extremely heterogeneous so that if we thought that housing alone was really going to make a huge difference, that's a very high bar for housing to have to pass over. And I think a major theme that we've heard throughout the day is that we have a very complex set of needs among the households who uh, are in the population that we're looking at, and we need to understand the interactions among those needs, how they really uh, come together or don't. And the MacArthur Network is sort of, um, you know, one of the greatest things I think that's happened in housing as far as I'm concerned because it's allowing us to really bite the bullet and look at fundamental questions which I believe if we don't look at those we're not going to make significant progress. So I'm most intrigued by two of the big black boxes that um, have been mentioned before, mainly by Tom Cook. First of all, what are the features of the housing context? And when I say housing context, I mean the full housing bundle, which extends to neighborhood, to schools, everything that you purchase or that you rent when you move into a place. Um, what features, both in combination and separately, really have an effect on the residents' well-being, the parents, the children, the elderly, the people with mental illness, and so on? And how do families actually make decisions, set their priorities, trade off their preferences? Um, we've done some qualitative work. This is the first qualitative work I've, I've actually done in my career. And um, very surprising comments from the people that we talked to uh, about what really mattered to them, how they made their decisions, what constraints they were operating under, which made it very clear to me that we have a huge gap that we need to fill here. And until we do so, uh, we're really going to be operating, um, I think, quite inefficiently. I have a yeah, yeah. Here. Um, just building on Sandy's list, to add a couple things. Number one, I would argue that in the housing field, uh, targeting has not been our strength as a country. Take public housing, for example. It is now the nation's largest program for aging in place. It is the largest program we have for the elderly poor. It wasn't designed to be that. Mm -hmm. The population that it serves is actually quite diverse. Um, the MPO population, actually the, the same, because it targeted public housing, right? You were living in public housing in one of five metros in the early 90s, and you expressed an interest in doing the move. Um, that population was far more diverse mm -hmm. than housing planners from HUD all the way down to the local agencies understood. I am thrilled that Jens and his team are able to de detect the, the effects they are and that we have some good news on the impacts years and years on. I also have to add a friendly rejoinder though, and that is if a fifth of your population is clinically depressed, 
are those necessarily the folks who can benefit the most from an intervention that only offered them a relocation? It didn't offer supportive services or anything right. else, right. right? So it begs these questions about who we're targeting with what kinds of things. Um, Derek made a really important point about sort of a force multiplier point, the neighbor revitalization, the knitting together, the yep. different things. I would say, you know, in addition to wanting to see more and more good research and, and these kinds of dialogues and, and so on to lift up the evidence and to keep pushing it forward, I also think at the same time we need to respect that we're talking about doing innovation uh, on the boundaries of, across fields in areas where we cannot wait half a generation for evidence in some instances. Um, we need to invest in real time in communities of practice in supporting practitioner learning in supporting, uh, you know, evidence on implementation strategies that work. That's not all going to have the blue chip social science quality to it, and that's fine. But Hope Six is a wonderful example of this, and I'll, right. I'll shut up and stop, mm -hmm. stop hogging the conversation. Um, you know, we spent years devolving tons of decisions and saying to people, in effect, mm -hmm. good luck, and not building a community of practice where folks could talk about what was hard to implement this dream of mixed income housing, it's a lot harder than it sounds to do it really well. And it's true if we go on, you know, going down the, the panel, all the different programs that have been mentioned and in the earlier panels as well. So I also want to see an investment in that and I want to challenge public and private funders represented in this room. Um, I think neither historically has jumped into that and said, how can we be intentional connecting practitioners and researchers in networks that are buzzing about things they're learning on the ground what's hard, how to get better at it. So Nancy wants to jump in here. I know Francie yeah. has a point of view on this as well. Okay, great. Um, I just, I wanted to, to pull a couple of things together from what Sandy said, thinking about gaps, to what Zab said about we can't wait for a generation. And also the previous <laughs> panel that was very focused on health and there was quite a bit of attention in the earlier panel to early, mm -hmm. uh, to the young part of the life course as a prime place for uh, investment and high payoff. Um, it, it's this, the things that cause poverty, it, that is a very complex problem. Mm -hmm. Jeff Lubell said earlier today that he was absolutely shocked to discover that people didn't necessarily fit into the silos of the federal budget, <laughs> nor the appropriators' uh, silos. Um, it is a complex problem that we need to find ways of knitting across. Um, we, know, we don't know everything we need to know. It's very difficult because it's so complex to tease out exactly what it is that causes the benefits that we see, um, but we know a lot. I think we know enough to make some bets, some educated guesses about where to deploy resources. And I think one of the gaps in the research, the gaps in, in how we've tried to understand the value of housing and community is in looking at young kids. Well, and the, as we were walking up the steps, I overheard Zav say, someone said 40 years, and Zav said, how about 17 months? <laughs> you know, we need information in 17 months. And um, one of the things that that we see happening, you know, on the last panel, I thought it was really, you know, it's exciting to hear someone say, we realize we're saving so much money by keeping somebody in their home. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's simple, right? So I can get it, so I make the change, and I give Nancy the money so that she can <laughs> keep them in the home. And, you, you know, when I look at our network and some other groups out there that are doing something that, seem to make an awful lot of sense. Uh, Southwest Minnesota Housing Partnership has a partnership with healthcare now where they pick the houses for rehab based on the kid who walks into the healthcare with asthma. Mm. So now they get the, and, and they've begun to document that, so using health care, I don't know if they're using health care dollars, but they're definitely partnering up where health can see that fixing the house is not just curing the one kid, but fixing the problem that's causing the health care problem. And we have a, a group in Woonsocket who has, Rhode Island, who has figured out how to get almost all the kids in this little neighborhood where nobody ever went to college and now they're all going to college. We have Foundation Communities in Austin who is running after school at no more than the cost that the after school program on, on the, at the schools cost 
and in addition is yielding a 3.42 average grade point average on those kids. We have Common Bond who's experienced, who's working to, after a group of us were meeting and we suddenly went, oh, what is it like the elders that family have? Oh, it's the kids. And so we started saying, well, where's the big gain? And we'd all listen to Nancy Andrews and said, the big gain is we could get them into school prepared for school. And, and so just let's look at the demographics of low-income housing, whether it's public housing, whether it's um, assisted, or even just tax credit housing. How many kids are under the age of five? And is that not a place where we could probably, for a fraction of the cost of full-time daycare, actually be getting kids ready for school. And so I guess just to wrap up, I'm very curious if we could, which is quite different from the deep research, could we go to sort of a prize for outcome? Mm. Could we price what it's worth to have a kid ready for school and then offer a prize for the houser who delivers their kids truly ready for school? So there's an evaluative element to it, but it, could, it, it might go to the speed question. Mm -hmm. Very interesting proposal. So, um, Derek, you mentioned earlier um, the neighborhood revitalization issue and how we had some departments and we talked a lot about silos today and agencies and policies working at cross purposes. There's another initiative um, that you helped to develop uh, that is attempting to do this. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what Strong Cities, Strong Communities is. and. Um, maybe cite a couple of examples, particularly where you're trying to align some federal agency work on this issue of how housing matters. Sure, um, and just on that last point you made before getting to that, there was actually a conference that the White House just had called Pay for Success. Yeah. And so there, there's a, the Office of um, Social Innovation and Civic Participation is looking at this very model as a way that we would fund federal um, programs where you get paid after you start to hit the outcome mm -hmm. that uh, the program um, has as a goal. Um, in any event, the Strong City, Strong Communities initiative is is a one very near and dear to my heart, near and dear to, to Erica's heart. Zav was very instrumental as well. Um, it kind of is an, it's an initiative that's designed really um, to do um, a couple of things. At, at its foundation, it's about building capacity in local governments and communities and building collaboration in those communities among a diverse um, set of stakeholders. There's also, to Zav's point, um, a strong component about community of practice and getting um, leaders in cities to share knowledge and information about how they attack certain challenges, how they implement certain strategies, um, and getting other stakeholders, not just on local electeds, to share that knowledge, and there's different components of the program. Um, the program, I think it's probably the largest interagency um, effort we have. I, there's 15 agencies or 16 agencies involved in Strong City, Strong Communities right now, and we may be adding um, a couple. The, the, the main um, part of the program um, is called, we have these community solutions teams where we literally send out interagency teams to work in cities. Mm -hmm collaboratively, so it's not just the federal government breaking down the silos, but they're working with local government agencies to also break down the silos um, at the local level. The six cities that we're piloting right now are Detroit, Cleveland, New Orleans, Fresno, um, Chester, Pennsylvania, and uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so we're in those six to start, and depending on how these pilots go, we're gonna look um, to expand, the, to expand where we go. And the, you know, they've been, the teams have been on the ground now for just a, a month and a half, and they're already um, starting to see very significant results. A lot of the focus of the teams is around um, economic development and trying to strengthen um, the economies of these places. So for example, in Fresno, there's a lot of work going on. Fresno's a city, it's a, 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 an urban area surrounded by a rural community and the downtown center of Fresno, California has completely been hollowed out. So there's like a walkway, um, kind of a walk promenade thing, but there's no businesses, there's no homes, there's nothing. And so we have a team on the ground 
that involve folks from EDA, the Department of Labor, also transportation because Fresno is going to have a high-speed rail hub and they're using that as, a, as an anchor to do downtown redevelopment. They want the high-speed rail train to station to be right there in the center of downtown. So we have different agencies working right now to think about what the economic development strategy is to get more businesses attracted. How do you leverage the transportation investments that's happening with the high-speed rail? How do you connect the economic development strategy to the workforce strategy? So you're getting people trained up in the jobs that you're going to need. And how do you do all of that to leverage the assets and the, assets and the strengths of the city and the region, which ties into the rural economy? And so if you look at each city, one of the things that we've learned a lot in our uh, urban policy work, and SC2 I think is a, a case in point, is that every community is different. And so every community has a customized team based on what they're trying to do. This wasn't the federal government coming in saying, here's what we think you should be, here's the best strategy, you do X. We actually went and said, what are you trying to accomplish? What's your economic vision or strategy? And how can we at the federal level better support you in getting there? And so with that, every city wants to do different things. Every city and region has different assets and strengths they want to leverage. And so SC2 has been a really, I think, great learning opportunity um, for the cities we're working in and for us at the federal level. I can't tell you how many emails I've received from the agencies who at first were a little skeptical, to be honest, about entering into this partnership and working with cities in this way. That they're, they, they're like, we're kind of doing our own thing. And they're writing now saying that it's changing the way in which they do their technical assistance and support and want to work with communities. They're seeing the more significant impact they can have by working hand in hand in partnership. So, so it's been really great. And thank you, because I think one of the themes we've heard today certainly is the need for more flexible policies uh, and approaches. And I'd like the panel to maybe, yeah, M Mike, sorry. I, just uh, one point. Um, Derek mentioned uh, kind of pay for success, and it reminds me, um, the question is how many housing programs are in a position to be eligible for a social impact bond or a pay for success model because mm -hmm. it requires rigorous top tier evaluation, proven effective programs. Um, I can't disagree with anything that Sandy said, but I would argue that in our chronic homeless programs, our HIV housing programs, our supportive housing programs that have been proven effective in Absolutely. clinical trials and random control trials, they are really at a level in which replication and funding conceivably could come through a pay for success right. model. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the next couple of weeks is going to be issuing an RFP in the chronic homeless area based on a social investment model where it would be pay for success. I would argue that what we heard on the health panel is in very early stages, but there seem to be, and it's not real rocket science, you don't have to answer a whole lot of the questions that Sandy raised to, to determine whether or not That's you can right. save That's the right. state of Ohio $100 a day by taking somebody out of a nursing home and putting them in an assisted living or a supportive housing environment. And so we need to do more evaluation rigorously of those programs while we are trying to deal with these long-term issues of how low-income people make choices that either support or are not supportive of, of kids and all of that. And that's why we put money into this long-term work. But to argue that we don't know enough to actually act in some of these areas based on research, I would disagree with. So yep, let me Sam. just footnote that, and this is something that, that Mike, uh, actually you have cited before. So um, long time ago when uh, HHS was doing um, waiver programs in which they were allowing communities to use the same amount of money that they would have received otherwise from the federal government to run their programs, they could actually do uh, experiments, uh, try innovative approaches, um, as long as they didn't spend any more than they would have spent otherwise. 
But the quid pro quo was they had to do research, rigorous research, right. on this. Emerging from those community, home and community-based uh, health uh, care program, waiver programs, actually emerged the seeds of the research that showed us mm -hmm. that going into nursing homes and finding people who could actually manage in the community saved money. This goes back decades. So we have actually known this for decades. What happened was that research got combined with other research where it wasn't unassailable that you were saving money. And I actually think this all um, got built up into a big ball in which you know the Class Act was just eliminated. The Class Act was an approach to try to help with long-term care needs. And the problem, I think, at least one fundamental problem was that there was a combination of both the elderly with long-term care needs with younger populations who have long-term long -term care needs that are very different from those of the elderly. And I haven't looked at the analyses, but I would venture to guess that the financial uh, debacle of the Class Act was caused much more by the huge costs associated with caring for a younger population than the long-term care needs of the elderly. So I'm hearing a couple things. Pay for success, maybe an interesting new policy approach to pursue. Attaching um, waiver requests to research. Are there other um, policies, if you could change one local, state, federal policy uh, as it relates to the issues we've talked about today, what would, what would it be, Nancy? Oh my, uh, I knew, I knew, the way you were looking at me, I knew you were gonna pitch that, that to me. <laughs> you know, um, I'm gonna give you a more general answer than a specific okay. one, but I think what I would try to change, I would try to shift the emphasis toward investing in young kids with, um, with a surround of programs, starting with housing, but including many other programs along with them. I would try to, to, to unlock uh, the various uh, revenue streams that go into communities mm -hmm. now and allow community developers that are a rich infrastructure, a huge nas national asset that's been created over the last 30 years, deploy that asset toward uh, creating the kind of success stories that we hear from purpose-built communities, from uh, yeah, foundation yeah. communities, from the kinds of things that you're talking about, Derek. Um, but, but bring these pieces together, fast-track the programs, unlock the, uh, the revenue streams. So I teach at a planning school. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of a charade, I'm gonna not only second, <laughs> but build on Nancy's idea. Um, I think she's exactly right. I mean, I think when it comes, for example, to pay for success, we're likely to see faster take up in areas like prisoner recidivism and a, a mm -hmm. couple of other areas. I'm really encouraged by what's going on in homelessness. Uh, my, my current students and former students are writing the RFP right now. I'm proud of what they're doing. I'm excited to see where it goes. It's great and other states should try this in homelessness and other areas. Um, but I think Nancy's right. Uh, in housing and health in particular at this intersection, Use whatever metaphor you want, planets aligning, perfect storm. Uh, the structural forces are so enormous, the aging the population, the need to bring down costs while improving outcomes. This is a once in a generation opportunity uh, if you work in housing and community development. And of course, if you work on the healthcare side, healthcare side of the equation. I, I want a friendly, a friendly amendment though to what you said. I think it is also beyond being an opportunity for people that have worked um, producing housing, delivering housing services, housing-based stuff for a long time. It is also a really healthy discipline. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say this in the past, and I think you have it right. There's no free lunch. Right. You don't get to claim uh, an impact through some mysticism of community development. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're positioned in a particular way and you have particular values and you work with residents, you are necessarily having an impact. That's right. Some of this stuff is hard to change. It's hard to move the needle. And there is a healthy discipline to, we want to achieve certain income, uh, outcomes, excuse me, we want to save dollars, and we want to connect you with expertise. You know, there are people who have learned things who can offer guidance as you work to implement. I think that's got to be a part of the equation. I second your friendly amendment. Thank you. I agree. Good. Anybody else want to offer up Mike? You know, even the MTO uh, study uh, makes the point on on young children that the results that came out of the experimental uh, side, the low poverty side, can't compete 
on kids outcomes with really high quality early childhood education at this point and so I would agree absolutely about the bias of our investments it's not clear to me that a strategy of investing kids is really housing centered uh, in in that sense of where the public resources would go but I absolutely agree on the investment but I I must say um, I the scoring issue <laughs> is, I think, an important one. And uh, in September, uh, the director of OMB did send guidance to agencies with a very high bar saying that programs that produce savings in other federal program areas could be scored by subtracting those savings against the costs of the housing program, if the housing program is what's doing it. Now, this is brand new. It's who knows how and what its future course is. But if you just look at MTO, for example, it doesn't deal with costs. But a Baltimore Regional Mobility Section 8 program, according to the head of the Baltimore Housing Authority, the voucher costs about 150 percent of the average voucher cost, and the two years of much more enhanced mobility and support services that last two years, it's wraparound support to the movers that move to these low poverty areas, costs about twice as much as the administrative cost of an average voucher. Mm. So if we can't find a way, the trade-off that we're going to be making is are we willing to give up volume, as, as small as that volume is relative to need, to really achieve more uh, you know, desirable outcomes for fewer number of families and kids? Mm, yeah, interesting. So I have one last question for the panel, and I want everybody to, to take a, have an opportunity to respond to this. Uh, I think we've been here for nine hours. <laughs> a lot has been said, uh, a lot of wonderful nuggets. I've been tweeting some of those wonderful uh, nuggets and um, love it if everybody could go down um, here and reflect on one piece of knowledge uh, that you took away from today that you think we can really um, build upon uh, going forward. Sam, do you want to start? Okay. Um, it's hard to pick just one, but I was encouraged to hear, uh, it may have been Megan, I'm not sure who on the prior panel, talk about housing insecurity mm -hmm. and different ways to measure it. In the housing field, field of fields, for many years, you know, metrics have been debated, but we tend to focus on affordability. Do we use a share? Do we call it shelter poverty? Do we, you know... The, use a housing wage related to the low wage market uh, for jobs. Um, and that all has a value. But the notion that specific distinct measures of housing insecurity uh, are so highly predictive of health and perhaps other social outcomes, um, I think is a part of creating this bridge. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a healthy thing for housers to hear. Um, and it's something that points to analyses one can do, conversations one can have that don't always have to take the randomized trial, you know, mm -hmm. multi-year study. Uh, you can go to decision makers and say, see, this is urgent, it is costly, we could um, spend better, mm -hmm. and we could be more humane at the same time. Um, I would say what struck me the most, particularly uh, in the last panel was the idea of housing as a vaccine or as preventive mm -hmm. medicine, thinking of it as that part of the big circle that was yellow, which was the environmental uh, impacts that determined so much of life outcome. Um, so thinking of housing in that way. And um, I, I guess I would just amend what Mike was saying a little bit earlier, that I do think we can think of the home and the place is very important to eventual child development. So I do think housing has a center role to play uh, when it comes to child investment. 
I'm at a slight disadvantage. <laughs> My experience of today has been this panel. Um, I wasn't here for the earlier um, moment, so I will rely more on what the, the, my other um, co-panelists have to say. But I think, you know, for me, the big takeaway and the big reinforcement is really, you know, what this conference is all about, kind of the mm -hmm. whole purpose and mission of the conference, which is something that um, we've been really trying to push out at a federal level of the, the interconnection of housing to other issues mm -hmm. and the impact it has um, across the board. I don't know if issues around housing and uh, public safety came up, but I've had a lot of they conversations. Yep. So I think that's a very um, fruitful area where more could be right. um, explored. Thank you, Derek. I'm glad I guessed on that. Francie? You know, I, I was very struck that with healthcare and now the fact that Sandy just added that some of that research was started out of the waiver program. Mm -hmm. 70. In the 70s. But recently I heard that we're spending $4 on old people for every $1 we're spending on young people. And I think that's sort of not sustainable for a, any culture. And that Nancy drew me the graph that shows that you know, the biggest point where you can influence someone's life is the, the very early ages. Therefore, having heard Jen's talk about, or Jen's talk about the impact of health, and Heather talk about the impact of location of schools, I just feel like we must go after, as we have in health, to the point now where you can actually begin to get at this, it saves X. We must go at the same thing in family housing, <coughs> all the way through tax credit housing for what we could be doing for the youngest children to have them entering school healthy and prepared for school and, and that we could focus right there in terms of saving lots and lots of public money for health and education. So I want to come to Mike last and Sandy ask you to go next. Sure. Nancy, well, I, I agree with others. It's very, very hard to choose, but I certainly endorse uh, uh, Derek's point that we need to look at housing within a context of multiple mm -hmm. other needs because individual, as Jeff said, individuals have complex needs. They are very heterogeneous, and we have to get there. Now, we, some might argue we haven't done such a great job dealing with a single need, and now we're gonna to move to the integration across needs, so there's a major challenge there. Um, I do wanna say, um, I, uh, I don't wanna pit one generation against another. We have important needs across the age spectrum, and um, we have a, you use perfect storm, we have a tsunami of elderly people like myself moving <laughs> through that, uh, the python and the pig, and uh, we have, you know, spend decades dithering around about this issue, but we have to do something about it. And I'm very excited about the um, coordination, cooperation between HUD and HHS, at least getting the administrative data connected and uh, so we can get a lay of the land, what we're dealing with. Mike. Uh, it's not really a uh, takeaway of a single uh, bit of knowledge, it's really a reminder and a reflection um, that high quality research has generational implications. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was reflecting on the MTO, um, planning for MTO started under the George H.W. Bush administration. It was conducted during the Clinton administration the interim results were released during the George W. Bush administration, <laughs> and these final historical results are released under the Obama administration. High quality research and evaluation uh, is neither Democratic nor Republican, and one administration bequeaths to its successors powerful new knowledge of how housing matters. And um, the worst thing in the world is to be in Erica's position, um, to be in a situation where the secretary asks you, what can we do about an urgent problem? 
and you say we want to do a random control trial <laughs> of family self-sufficiency. Um, so you've got to have answers on what do we know that we can act on, right. mm -hmm. but you've got to also put resources away for that long-term study because future generations are going to benefit from it. That's my... Uh, right. So on that note, and in closing, uh, I really want to thank our panelists, but I want to thank MacArthur and many of the other uh, philanthropies, but other um, agencies that have invested in housing research that have been part of that um, generational obligation that we and HUD and PDNR have really benefited from. It's almost every day I do thank um, future <laughs> prior administrations or foundations uh, for that investment in research because it has improved our policies. It's formed the foundation of doing um, better work and I think MTO is, a, is a, just a fine example of that. Um, but we need to make more critical investments in research to inform the next generation of policies. And we in HUD and PDNR really look forward to a partnership uh, in doing that with you. So thank you. Let us thank our panel. Please join me one more time to thank Erica and this really impressive panel for such a great discussion. And I want to thank all of you for participating in today's conference. Um, once again, I would like to thank our partners at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and the Office of Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the tremendous work of my own staff, especially Scott Kratz, our Vice President of Education. Thank you, Scott. Today, we heard from experts from across this country describe housing as a healthcare, economic, and educational intervention. Housing does not exist in a vacuum, and to find comprehensive and sustainable solutions, we need to break down the silos and examine these topics through an interdisciplinary lens. We invite you to continue to explore these issues with us as we collectively find innovative answers to the critical issues that this nation faces. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful evening.